Now please allow me to introduce Mato Nyavro, <coughs> Dean of the uh, School of uh, Zagreb School of Economics and Management. Mato has obtained, uh, and he's a very educated man. He's not like me. I'm pr practitioner. Mato is true academic. He is. Um, he has a master in economics and management. <coughs> and corporate finance from University of Bocconi and doctorate from University of St. Gallen. He is not a true academic, or sorry, he is not only academic because he spent several years working as investment banker in Lehman Brothers and also in Bank of Nomura. He was teaching at Harvard University, St. Gallen, uh, Zeshem, of course, Luxembourg School of Business, and the most recent position that he was holding <clears throat> was a lecturer at, um, at uh, Singapore uh, Management University, and that was for the last four years. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, my boss, uh, dean of uh, our school, and my Great friend, Matanyavo. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruno. You are far too kind. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming today, physically in person, but also to those of you who are watching us on one of the streaming platforms. It's great to have you. Bruno is obviously in, in, in uh, his own style being far too humble about himself and far too... Uh, optimistic and braggish about myself. So uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, coming and presenting after him on the topic of supply issues is, is uh, filling up very big shoes uh, because a person who has made a, quite a stellar career, uh, not only for this part of Europe, but in general, having been the CEO of uh, Coca-Cola in China and then the, the head of Coca-Cola for Asia Pacific, I mean, I'm sure that... Uh, supply chain uh, issues was something that he was dealing on a daily basis. I can only imagine what uh, being CEO of Coca-Cola China implies. Just, get, just getting the logistics of, the, of that uh, immensely huge country and, and co making sure that everybody, every person in China can get a, his or her hand on, on Coca-Cola, whether from, from the coastal region or all the way down uh, uh, inwards. I mean, um, Quite impressive. So we're very happy to have you, Bruno, here at Zagreb School of Economics and Management, and thank you for organizing and for being kind of the, the lead person together with our Maria and, and our whole wonderful team of speakers. Uh, and I think, I mean, um, there is, it's probably, uh, there's no other pressing issues current, or issue currently happening in the world uh, than uh, the supply chain one. And I will uh, have two main points uh, in my today's presentation. So I will not go into the details. Um, I will try to provide a slightly wider context and then uh, let our my colleagues who are coming after me to, to kind of uh, uh, maybe be a little bit more specific. But my idea is to take it up where Bruno has left it and, and, and say uh, where he said that the current breakdown in supply chain, if we can call it breakdown, uh, is not only due to the COVID. Okay, so this is where I want to take it. Uh, this is where I want to take your baton and, and, and say that I fully agree with you. And in my presentation, I was really... Uh, if you, you will see, I mean, when it gets to it, we did not coordinate our presentations, but this is, it, it's really the essence on what I will build uh, my presentation on. And then the second thing that I will discuss is I don't think today it's possible to discuss supply chain uh, divorced from the major uh, situation or issue of the 21st century, which is the, the West, or let's say the US and Europe's relationship with China, because this is at the core of, of the global uh, supply chain. So let me first go with, uh, with my point number uh, one, which is um, the, yes, I can control this. Okay, so my point one, number one is supply chain breakdown did not happen as a result of COVID. It happened as a result of every single one of 
us as a result of my desires. Sometimes, you know, you want to get something from, uh, you want to order something for, for Christmas, you don't think about it, you go on website, and within a couple of days, uh, that thing, wherever it's from, probably, and highly, there's a high likelihood that it's produced in China, will within a week, mass, maximum two weeks, arrive at the footprint at your, at your doors. So all of us, the fact that the supply chain broke is, is a feature, not a bug, of the system. One of my favorite books uh, that, that uh, uh, I, I like to reread every couple of, maybe ten, every few, few years, is a book by Nassim Taleb, Anti-Fragile. We have built, when I say we, I mean the world has opted for building a very fragile supply, system, supply chain system. We have opted for efficiency at the expense of robustness. Okay, back in the days, Bruno mentioned that I was, in fact, living in Singapore from 2016 to 2020. And one of my favorite things at the time, well, uh, in Singapore, one of the, the ways that I, I enjoyed spending time was uh, you would go up to this Marina Bay Sands hotel that I'm sure you're all familiar with, the beautiful hotel with three towers connected with a pool on top. And what we would do is there's a very nice bar on top and we would order a drink with my friends, and then we would watch uh, the view just behind it, where it, which is essentially the Straits of Malacca, one of the, the key highways for global trade, where more than 40% of global trade happens, right? And what, the reason why we did this, and uh, mind you, I'm talking about time when shipping was not as sexy as it is today. The business was not doing uh, that well. All the people in the industry were complaining about the low uh, uh, rates that, that they could get on the global markets. And the reason why we like to watch this area just in front of the Changi port is because, you know, over the years, over the months, you would see more or less ships being anchored there. And I, was, I always had this discussion with a colleague of mine. He said, Mato, this is a, a colleague of mine from University of St. Gallen who uh, lives in, in, in Singapore, he, he, he used to say, Mato, this is a topic for a PhD thesis, really. What can you infer about the health of global economy from just observing the amount of anchored ships in the Changi, uh, in the Changi port? And uh, that is why I would also like to uh, start my presentation with a photo of a ship. And this is a ship that might be familiar to some of you, ever given the name of the ship, March this year, right? Anybody know the story of the ship? This is a real. This is no. no this is. This is. Uh, there's no Photoshop here. This is a real uh, photo of this ship that, uh, in March this year, had a somewhat of an accident in the Suez Canal. Uh, it took more than I think for almost a week. The ship was essentially uh, blocking the pathway of, of Suez Canal, and roughly. Almost up to almost 20% of global trade, as a result of, of, of this ship, has kind of uh, came to a halt. When I come back to my my my, my first point, my my maybe the, the key point that I'm trying to to get across about the the global supply chain system, and this photo really uh, paints the picture quite well. Our global supply chain system has been designed in such a way that efficiency is preferred to robustness, okay? Suez Canal, I mean, uh, itself, right, built in the beginning of the 19th century by the French is a testament to this, uh, to this statement because before that, I mean, you could go all, all, over, all around Africa, but this made it uh, much more, but much quicker. It would save w one full week on the sea if you, if, if the ships uh, got across this uh, across the Suez Canal. So um, I think that is one key message. So the system that we have is not anti-fragile; it is fragile. Had it not been for COVID pandemic, something else uh, would have given, right? So uh, and. Which brings me to my next uh, key, let's say, topic of, of today. I mean, I don't have too much time. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some time for Q&A. But, but I do not really believe that you can talk about global supply chains without talking about uh, 
the relationship between uh, China and the West, or in this case, uh, China and the, and the, and the U.S. And uh, where I could, where I like to start, when, when is first of all, Bruno already mentioned it, but uh, I, I like to show this chart, right, uh, which essentially shows you that for the last 2,000 years and some. It's only been really the 200 years from the beginning of 19th century to, let's say, uh, end of 20th century that China has not been the world's largest economy, right? So we're talking about uh, only this period, let's say from the 1870s to, to here. So usually, I mean, what I did in Singapore at Singapore Management University was I was teaching a course on, on Chinese economics and then I would take my students uh, at the end of the course, we would travel to China, visit companies there. Uh, it, was a, it was a kind of a course that was supposed to give them an insight of what is happening there. And what I always like to tell them, the, the fact that China is returning on the global stage is more of a re-emergence then just uh, they didn't come out of nowhere. So the last 200 years is is a, is a statistical anom anomaly from a from a Chinese perspective, right? And there's this very good story uh, to kind of uh, demonstrate uh, how Chinese like think long term, as opposed to sometimes us in the West, especially in the U.S., where there's short term focus on 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 short term profit driven by the whole. Uh, Wall Street capitalist uh, system uh, is the story from, and um, uh, you can later dis you can check whether it's completely true or not. But apparently, the Chinese Prime Minister in the Zhou Enlai, who was a Prime Minister during Mao, was in France in the 60s, uh, 1960s, and he was asked by the French journalists, "What is the view of the?" Chinese Communist Party, what view does it have on the effects that French Revolution had on the European society? And apparently, he said, it's too early to tell. It's too early to tell. It's only been 300 years, so it's, it's, it's a little bit too early to tell. And uh, so there is this, I don't know if it's, uh, you can check it for yourself, but, but I, I kind of like that story because it does give you a sense of uh, different type of uh, time frames that we are operating uh, on here. Um, when we talk about U West relationship with, uh, with, uh, with China, I mean, um, you often hear the word or the syntagm, the new Cold War, right? The new Cold War between the US. It's a very poor, intellectually lazy way to describe a, a, a much more complicated and much more complex situation, right? The reason why it's so poor is because uh, uh, if, we, if, we, if you really take Cold War as, a, as something that you can, you know, as an analogy for what we are lo uh, looking at today, uh, then you will understand that uh, uh, during the Cold War you had the U.S. with one system, capitalist system, and then you had the Soviet Union with a, a different system, a communist system. And eventually Soviet Union di has dissolved and the U.S. Uh, won. Today, Despite the fact that uh, China is officially uh, governed by the Chinese Communist Party, those of you who have had the chance to visit China or who you've, who've been to China, who've worked with the Chinese, you understand that, yes, to a certain extent, the political system is, is, is still uh, a Leninist communist system where, where one party hold, holds monopoly over, over the political power, but China is far from a communist country when it comes to business and the way that business is done. So what I want, my, my point here is I want to say that whereas before during the Cold War we had two powers, superpowers at that time, competing for two different systems, today China and the US are competing within the same system, right? Those of you who've been to China will also know that uh, uh, in many ways they are much, more, much less socialist than, for instance, many of the countries in Europe, right? And the so-called social safety net, uh, to a very large extent is a new, something new in China, does not exist to the extent that we have it here in Europe, right? So uh, that is the first most, most important point. China and US, US are competing within the same system. 
2001, China decided to join, or China joined WTO, World Trade Organization, and from then has been doing everything in, his in its power, and not just from then, I mean, let's say from the time that China decided to open itself again to the world, at the end of the 80s, China has invested billions of dollars in building the best possible infrastructure in the world in order to become the factory of the world. And this was supported by, it was supported by, 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 the, by the U.S., by the business, U.S. business community, by the European business community, who, who thought it, was, it would be a nice idea to outsource large parts of their production to China, uh, to the benefit of ultimately uh, uh, Western consumers who could then, uh, because all these price cuts could then be transferred uh, to the, to the initially to the Western consumers, but lately, uh, over the last, let's say, decade and so, as the Chinese middle classes have been growing also to them. So uh, this is something, this is why I don't think that the Cold War analogy is good in case of you or West and China's uh, relationship. They are both competing with the same in, within the same season, and the key word there is interdependency, right? One depends on another. And we cannot emphasize that uh, strongly enough. Um, what I can also say is that the global supply chain, it will be extremely difficult to kind of, uh, it will be extremely difficult for US, it will be extremely difficult for Europe to bifurcate, to, to uh, free itself from, uh, from this uh, interrelationship and interconnectedness that it has with China, because private companies have been investing for, for decades now, billions of dollars, uh, putting money in China and making sure that the global supply, uh, making sure that China is, is becoming a factory of the world. Um, I added something to my presentation, uh, which I want to address now, just uh, so that I don't forget it later on. And, and it was something, again, that, uh, that I saw in Bruno's presentation uh, as one of the factors that will affect in the future uh, supply chains, and that was global warming. And I have, uh, the reason why I put it, put it there is because I have a, it, it kind of clicked in my head. I have a, a good story to, to, to follow up exactly on that point. Uh, and that story is the story that from, uh, from uh, Singapore. Uh, I was very surprised when one of my Singaporean friends told me that Singapore as a country has asked uh, at the United Nations to become an observer of the Arctic Council countries. And Arctic Council is those countries that have legitimate, because of the geography, as in Chile, as in South Africa, as in Australia, all those countries. Uh, so Singapore wanted to become one of those one of those countries observers. Any any ideas as to why? Why would a tropical country, which is literally sitting on the equator, be interested in 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 being an observer on the Arctic Council? Why do they care about uh, the the you know the level of ice? Somebody. Okay, that is, and this is a very good answer because they're island countries. So if the sea rises, uh, obviously, you know, they, they're going to be uh, under a lot of pressure. <clears throat> However, they're preparing already for that. Uh, they have the best Dutch consultants and making, you know, they're already kind of reclaiming, reclaiming land from the sea. But there's another reason. So that's a very good point. But there's something else. Because if the, if let's say, uh, if, if, on Northern Pole, if the ice melts, it will open up new trade routes. So when you go, when you ship stuff from Shanghai, you will not necessarily go down Straits of Malacca. And Singapore having, I think now the second, it used to be second, now it might be the third uh, busiest port in the world after Shanghai and Ningbo. Uh, they are at the existential uh, threat, right? Because then, you know, uh, from Shanghai, it will be easier and cheaper to send stuff over the Northern Pole. So this is one, one of the effects that the global warming, one of the very real effects, and how some countries are already thinking about that and making sure that they are at the cutting edge of, 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 of uh, the events, events and developments in this, in this field. Um, as I was saying, the U.S. now, especially during, uh, it was initiated during the former Trump administration, this new 
era, this new st strategic approach to China, but it was initiated during Trump, but despite the fact that the Americans these days cannot seem to agree on anything, right? You, you all see how divided the American society is. One thing they seem to be able to agree on is their uh, approach and view to China. So even the Biden administration is still keeping the line quite steady and not really deviating from what previous administration has done. Uh, and they, there is a feeling that they want to, they would like, they're not comfortable in being in this interdependent position with China, labeling China as the global, major global competitor, but at the same time depending on China so much. Uh, in some industries, you will see this breakage of the link happening. And we have witnessed that, let's say uh, the internet, right? So there is a clear kind of uh, separation uh, there uh, with the Chinese firewall. So no Western company has really managed to do something in, in, in China. And I think the attitude both in Europe as well as in the US of, of kind of expansion of the Chinese tech giants, uh, the, attitude, the attitude is becoming less uh, positive. You've seen that with, with Trump's abrupt TikTok decision, where it essentially uh, it essentially told by uh, what's it called the 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 the, the, the main company bes behind TikTok. Uh, I forgot. I, I'm I'm lacking the name. But uh, Trump's administration. No, it's not Baidu. It's uh, it's something B. But anyways, uh, Trump forced them to sell international operations of 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 TikTok. So you see that in internet, it's already happening in 5G telecoms, it's happening, right? You've seen what happened to uh, both to Huawei internationally in Europe and in the US, they're, they're finding it extremely difficult to do business, but also Ericsson in China, they were, they were doing pretty uh, well. It was a very important market for, for them up until the point where, where, the, where, where this whole thing with uh, Huawei escalated also in Sweden and in Europe, and now Ericsson is, is uh, having a hard time doing business in China. So in these, in certain sectors, you will see this kind of delinkages happening. In many other sectors, it will be extremely difficult exactly because of the interdependencies uh, between the two. And just to kind of show you graphically that I'm, what I was saying, two important points. First of all, uh, over the two, uh, over the past two and a half decades, China has displaced the US at the center of global value chains, right? So if you look at 1995, uh, the, the, the little the graph, the network graph on the left, you see here US is at the core, China is some small thing tangentially, tangentially only connected. 2016, and this is from World Bank, 2016 you see that China put itself at the core of global value chain. Anything these days you want to get produced, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to do it without certain input from China. Um, there's some positives also. The one positive is that, first of all, the, the US, the Europe-Asia trade is, forms the largest trading block in the world. Uh, one point, if you can't see it, 1.6 trillions, as, op as opposed to 1.4 trillions between the uh, Asia and, and uh, North America. So my point here is to say that, uh, yes, we are at a highly interdependent situation, both in terms of Europe-China relations as well as the US-China, but it's also a great opportunity because you, you see that this trade, I mean, this is a, a massive trade. This is a massive opportunity for European companies, uh, Croatian companies included, uh, to take part of this huge mega trend happening in Asia, uh, which is the massive rise uh, of the middle class and their power in China. So uh, it's going to be very hard to decouple. However, as I said, the current situation does not make US feel very comfortable. So there are these attempts to reshore right, production. Let's bring production, let's bring production back to the US. Let's make America great again. Let's bring back our factories to the US. Uh, yes, there certainly are these attempts, but how difficult this is, you can find out in probably one of the most interesting documentaries I've seen recently. Uh, has anybody seen this, this documentary on Netflix? 
the American factory. Yes. So if you want to realize, if you want to understand how difficult these days the whole process of reshoring and bringing factories back to the U.S., there is no better uh, story or documentary to see than, than this one. If you have Netflix, I highly recommend this. Uh, the main point of, of, of the documentary being once the know-how is lost, once you know the workers have, have lost this know-how that has been generated for decades, it's not easy to replicate it soon. This documentary is about a Chinese company, Chinese automotive supplier, buying an American, I think it's in Ohio, an American automotive supplier, exactly trying to take advantage of these policies that are favoring the reshoring. It does not end very well. And in the movie, you have uh, quite a lot of funny, funny uh, uh, anecdotes on, on, on how difficult it is to bring production back to, in this case, to the States, but uh, so how difficult it is once the know-how has been lost. And just Bruno said it uh, that I would also uh, comment, and I, I will comment uh, on this because this is a super important point, and there has been probably no other better example of how this interdependency between the West and China works than one particular segment of the industry. And I'm obviously referring to the semiconductors, right? So if you want to understand uh, how interdependent the West is with China uh, with semiconductors, then I can show you this, this graph, which is the location of semiconductor companies by step in their production value chain, right? And you see when it comes to design, manufacturing, assembly, and testing, which is, let's say, this is the high-end value-adding part, right? Uh, US is almost 57%. Korea is 29%. So most of the design happens, you know, in, in Intel's, in, A, uh, in AMD's. Japan is 11%. Europe is 7%. China is... Nowhere, nowhere. When it comes to design of semiconductors and this, China does not exist on the global value chain. When it comes to uh, design, manufacturing, or assembly of uh, fables, then China shows up here. But when it comes to just manufacturing and assembly and testing, China again shows up. But you see, who, the green line is Taiwan, uh, which uh, dominates again the, the semiconductor industry. So. Uh, one area where China is much more dependent on, on the West than the West is on China is, is this semiconductors. On the other hand, right, so you have the most, let's say the most important, one of the most important semiconductor companies is in Taiwan. Uh, and uh, without access to the products of that company, uh, it, is, it is the whole Chinese industry, but not just that, the whole global global supply chain does not function. Any, anybody want to guess? So, okay, when it comes to the, the supply, to the source of semiconductors, we see that China is not really a player as much as they are trying to become investing billions and billions of dollars, but it's, it cannot happen overnight. In terms of demand, anybody want to guess what percentage of global demand for semiconductor goes in China or rep is represented by China? 40, but so almost 40 to 45, uh, exactly. So, so you see, uh, we're talking about interdependency. Yes, okay, the US uh, or, or Europe or South Korea here who are kind of controlling these companies, they, they do ha hold certain leverage over China. But what is, the, what is the option? That they just close themselves to almost 50% of the global market and, and by doing that essentially crippling and killing their semiconductor companies? Is that really an option? So um, this is something that I this is a, something that I leave you with more of as a, as a question than, than giving you a straight answer. Uh, if you want to understand also, if let's say if the semiconductors is an area where China is more dependent on U.S. and Europe than other way around, what what are the, some other industries where Europe and U.S. are more dependent uh, on China than China on itself? It's for instance electric vehicles. We hear all the time about electric vehicles here in Europe, uh, also in the US with the Tesla, uh, amazing success of, of, of Tesla story. But uh, 
uh, might be a little bit less well marketed. The, the true, ele just like you had the petrol states, you know, in the Gulf, Saudi Arabia, and so you have in the future the electro states, and there's no other better electro state example than China. It's highly electrified already when it comes to the mobility, right? This is at a, at a level that that you don't see uh, in Europe or in the U.S. So uh, because they also have uh, uh, control pretty much the the, the lithium um, supply chain links. This is where uh, this is what makes U.S. more dependent and Europe more dependent on China. Uh, when, it, when, it, when we talk about uh, renewable energy, cybersecurity, air, robotics, blockchain, they are mutually dependent. So there is one depends on another, and they're codependent when it comes to medical devices. But the most important point here is. Semiconductors, uh, this is definitely where the West, US, and, and Europe still holds an edge, and also the aerospace. aerospace. If you want to understand uh, more about uh, an aerospace uh, in China, I can only highly recommend one book called China Airborne. It's a book about the history of uh, uh, aviation in China, and it, will, it, it is an amazing book uh, that will give you a sense of uh, how difficult it is even when you have all the, all the will in the world and all the billions that you can imagine to build up a highly complex industry such as airspace. China has not been able to date to do it successfully or, or give them enough time and, 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 and even that gap and that delta will, will change. So I don't know, I mean, if I manage to uh, answer any questions, I probably manage to raise more than I answer, but this is just some, something that I want to share with you, provide a little bit of context before uh, giving the floor uh, to my uh, colleagues and, and my next speakers. Uh, so with that, I, I would say I'm open to your questions, suggestions, anything that you might have before I leave the floor. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor the Dean uh, for the very interesting presentation. Do we have some questions in the audience, please? If you want to share something with us. Yes. yes. In the meantime, we have a question on Zoom. So, in your opinion, when will China become dominant? How will that affect our lives? Um, I don't per se uh, think that China is aiming for some global uh, domination. Uh, as such, I, I think, as a, given that it's the biggest uh, country in the world by population, it's probably uh, it's only just that they are seeking uh, their their place uh, in the world. In so, uh, and this is not something that should be uh, of, of a surprise to anybody, right? I show you that that graph uh, that shows that you know, for a very large part of history, their their economy constituted the biggest economic block in the world. Then they had this what is in Chinese mind known as 200 years of, 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 of uh, Liu Yuan, how do, uh, 200 years of, of, let's say, disappointment or, or shame when China was weak and low, and now they're rising back again, and they're asking for a place in the world. They already dominate, as you could see from that last graph, certain parts of, of the global supply chain. When it comes to, let's say, as I said, the electric vehicles, if you believe that the electric vehicles is the future of mobility. So if you subscribe to that school of thought, and I would say many people in Europe and the US do that, then uh, you really have to be looking not, not really what's happening here or in the US, the real electrical revolution is happening in China. Third tier Chinese cities that you have never heard of, I have electrified completely their, 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 um, their traffic. The public buses are electric. Uh, most of the cars are electric. One personal anecdote uh, from the time that I used to visit China frequently uh, before this COVID pandemic was when I would go to Shanghai, right? And I don't remember exactly what year it was, but I, I exactly remember that one year when everything changed. So up until that year, and I'm guessing it's 2013, 14, or 15, every single scooter in, in China, in, in Shanghai, was using the old internal combustion engine. So you had your Vespas, your Piaggios, your uh, the, the Chinese copycats uh, of the same. But every scooter was was uh, an old school scooter. 
From one year to another, I came back, every single scooter, in, and we're talking about, imagine, I mean, millions of scooters in, in Shanghai is electric. And it really, it really hit me, whoa, this magnificent change, I mean, to, to change all the scooters in a, in a city with 15 million people, Wow, it, 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 it's something, right? Uh, so, uh, as I said to, to that uh, kind question from, from our Zoom listeners, when will China uh, be dominant? In some aspects, it's already dominating the industry. In others, in others, it's still struggling. Aerospace, semiconductors, the semiconductors being the, the heart, or that's the central nervous system of almost any complex product, it's, <laughs> it's China is still lagging there, right? So Europe, as well as the U.S. through their friends in Taiwan, control, uh, control the. Um, somebody was. I, I was re listening to this uh, podcast the other day, and this guy was uh, uh, mentioning how Taiwan, in any case of, in any in, in a case of potential uh, conflict with China, uh, fa fa has a nuclear option, and this nuclear option is not. I'm not talking about nuclear weapons, right? Taiwan could just, let's say, decide to sabotage and demolish their own uh, uh, com company producing the, the, the chips, which is the, by far the leading company in the world. Ima what happens then? Imagine. What happens if, if Taiwan decides to just n blow up their leading... China is uh, is not going to be very happy about that because they need they need this to to keep their engine uh, operating. So, yes, colleague, please. What's your name? Hello, Boris Vaura. I'm from Prima Kushped, freight Hi, forwarding and customs. Welcome. So I'm from maritime studies. Ah. Uh, first, I want to comment. Do you know why Singapore is such an important place on the earth regarding shipping industry? Because uh, is it 50% of trade? Yes, mass yes. Mass but how it became that? Because the wind are changing there. Ah. So when the uh, in the middle century, when they go from the Far East to the England, they change their uh, uh, ah. uh, the ships there to so that they can go go against the wind, then tr down the wind. I've been there for so four years. I never heard this one. So yes, thank you. This yes, is very interesting. yes, and it's very very interesting history moment. So that was the first thing. The second thing is uh, I was listening to you and uh, to Professor before. Uh, you have mentioned the big uh, uh, changes in the in the world regarding the supply chains. So my 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 question was, what will happen with the supply chain when each continent and each state have their own factories? So can you imagine that we have factories of chips in Croatia? Who would need Shimpi company? Who would need airplane? What, uh, what kind of the, the vehicles we will use if everything is 100 kilometers far away? Mm. And how quick we will be if everything is around? So, just uh, uh, opinion. No, on this, that, is a, on that this is a great, uh, great question. It's, uh, uh, sorry, just to forget, we didn't mention carbonization. I think decarbonization, because decarbonization means that everything is nearby, nothing is far away. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, it, it's a great question. It's ultimately it's a philosophical question, right? Because it it re it requires you to think of the world so much different than the one where we currently live in, right? I cannot see really uh, us going so far, uh, as, you know, reshoring so far that every continent will be self-sufficient. I mean, we'd, you kind of had that in, during the, the, the Cold War, right? Because Soviet Union was kind of autarkic, right? It was closed, it was self-sufficient, not trading with the world. Uh, I think the whole architecture of the modern global world is based on, on certain uh, on globalization and on the you know free or relatively free movement of of uh, capital and and and, uh, and and well labor to a to a lesser extent but definitely capital so i, I it's i really don't know what's uh, i think your question is connected also with maybe the fourth industrial revolution so you have this additive manufacturing uh, 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 3D printing, which would, in theory, enable you know anybody to print something at their home. So maybe you know maybe one day we will have 
you know, our own 3D printers for our own chips and, or our own phones. Uh, but this is so, f I feel it's a little bit uh, far ahead for me, at least, to, to imagine this world. I don't know what uh, Professor Bruno thinks, but um, there, is, there is a certain, if you want something, and you know it much better, I mean, you know it from your own industry, uh, this ever, ever, what, what's it called, ever given ship is one of the biggest ships in the world. And the reason why uh, these ships these days exist is because the bigger the ship, the cheaper the stuff that they carry, right? So if you, if you, you know, you have smaller ships or you, everything, the price uh, will escalate. I, I, I don't, you know, you don't have the economies of scale. Uh, so I don't see us reverting back to that level. I, th I, I see the future as a kind of a coexistence, interdependent, interdependent coexistence, sometimes less comfortable, sometimes more comfortable with between the West and, and Asia and China, which I think is also good because if we depend on one another, there is going to be less opportunity for some conflict, right? Like I said in that small example with Taiwan and the potential nuclear option to blow up the factory, not to shoot nuclear weapons. Bruno, what do you think? Uh, very good question. It will not happen. So this onshoring that Matu was talking about uh, can be replaced with another term which is called nearshoring. Nearshoring. So it will be a combination of large companies and large countries which have resources, like I mentioned before, uh, Volkswagen building a chip factory. <clears throat> large countries, large companies will do onshoring and inshoring, okay? Other economies in, in, in Europe, uh, smaller companies, smaller countries will do this nearshoring and will do something which uh, Nadir and uh, Amir will talk about just a little bit later, about inventory management, about dual, triple supply chains or sourcing, okay? And the topic of Nadir is called is because basically this is your question. Yeah, yeah. Your question is, is this the end of just-in-time manufacturing? No, it's not the end. But the hybrid will happen, okay? So it's not a binary thing, Mato, if you agree. Mm -hmm. It's not a binary thing, off or on, but certain interventional interventions in the supply chain will certainly, certainly happen. Is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm not afraid, you, know, because yeah, you don't have to be afraid <laughs> if you are the owner of a, <laughs> of a logistics company. <laughs> or a ship for that matter. <laughs> a shipping company. It, you know, the best would be if you are the owner of a, of a 300 meter container ship today. <laughs> you know, that would be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> today, be your, yeah. not three years ago or four. No, no, today, not <laughs> five years ago. You know, today, yeah. that's your best option. Buy Thank one. you very much. Buy one. Any You're other welcome. questions or? Okay. Maybe, Bruno, do you want to uh, present our next speaker? I will introduce, next speaker, uh, yeah. yes. yes. Um, Thank you very much.